thread links all these scenes, a thread of wool. In the 11,000 years since it was first domesticated, the sheep has thrived in widely differing conditions. Valley and mountain, sunshine and snow. Wool, transferred from a sheep's back to a man's, offers him the same natural protection against his environment, against extremes of heat as well as extremes of cold. These extremes affect us greatly because our body's internal temperature has to be kept constant, whatever the outside temperature may be, to within plus or minus half a degree. Regulating our temperature uses up energy, but this is energy we really need for our job and for coping with all the other demands our environment makes on us. Whether it's something that grows naturally or something we have to put on, one of the main functions of clothing is to assist the body in its struggle to maintain this constant internal temperature. And it is a struggle. Just consider what happens if we're exposed to extremes of temperature without proper clothing to protect us. In a normal environment, a subject will perform a standard manual dexterity test like this quickly and efficiently. But if she had to do the test at freezing point, her finger mobility would be cut in half, and after a while her mental efficiency would be affected almost as badly. She might be dumb, as well as numb with cold. To help us get warmer, we shiver, but we use up energy in the process. Wool clothing can lessen this demand on our energy. To help us get cooler, we sweat. This also uses up energy. And remarkably enough, wool can make such activity less tiring. When we sweat, liquid water is evaporated into water vapour, and the heat required to bring about this process is taken from the surface of the skin. If the clothes we're wearing get clogged with sweat, this cooling process of evaporation from the skin can't take place. If the sweat can be absorbed into the fibres of the garment without blocking the spaces between them, we feel cool and the garment feels dry much longer. Wool can absorb up to 33% of its own weight in water without feeling wet. Some man-made fibers only one or two percent. Because of this, wool doesn't cling uncomfortably to the body, making it sticky and tired, as some other fabrics do. Wool's capacity to absorb moisture works both ways. If you put on a warm, dry sweater and go out into a cold, damp street, as it absorbs the moisture in the air, your sweater, which can hold up to a pint of moisture without feeling clammy, actually gets warmer, perhaps by as much as two or three degrees centigrade. So naturally, your body's more comfortable and needs that much less energy to maintain its constant internal temperature. Wool not only absorbs moisture, it also traps and encloses air. A special technique of photography called Schlieren enables us to see this process in action. 
A system of mirrors, lenses and filters differentiates between layers of air at various densities and therefore at various temperatures. This is what a match flame looks like. We can see not only the flame, but the heated air rising from it. Now the human body always has a layer of warm air flowing next to the skin. It's clearly visible by Schlieren photography, and this gives us a natural barrier against changes of outside temperature. Put on a wool sweater and it has an interesting effect on this warm air flow. Most of it is prevented from escaping and so it can continue to play its protective role. This insulating effect is one of wool's most important properties and it possesses it to a greater extent than any other fabric. Wool not only keeps in, it also keeps out. Drop water on a synthetic fabric and it soaks in. Drop it on wool and it doesn't. That's why wool can keep us warm and dry in a rain shower. Because the droplets roll off like, you might say, water off a sheep's back. And off a sheep's back, magnified hundreds of times by the electron microscope, wool reveals some of the physical properties that give it its remarkable qualities. Each tiny fibre of wool is wrapped in a layer of scales, the cuticular layer. The very thin membrane surrounding this layer hinders the penetration of water in liquid form. But once the water has vaporised, it can penetrate the fibre and be absorbed by the cortex, hence wool's ability to hold moisture without appearing to be wet. A look at this model of the molecular structure of wool. The molecules line long interlocking chains, aligned with the growth of the fibre, and this gives wool another of its unique properties, extensibility. This model shows what happens to wool fibre under tension in water. The spiral chains of molecules become fully extended. Then, when the tension's released, they return to their original spiral form. Under normal conditions of humidity, merino wool will extend up to about 30% without losing its ability to return to its original shape. Cotton will extend only 9%. Then it breaks. The crimp or wave in each individual fibre of wool adds to its elasticity and helps to make it comfortable and flexible in wear, and so less tiring. The crimp also helps wool to hold its shape. Again, the crimp makes each individual fibre, as this microphotograph shows, keep its distance from its neighbour. So a wool fabric contains innumerable small air spaces. One pound of wool fibre may have 70 square metres of surface area. This capacity to contain air, up to 80% of the fabric's total volume, is what gives wool its insulating effect. Chemical and physical examination of wool fibres can give us much information, but to evaluate the properties of wool as a clothing material, it's necessary to conduct comparative experiments using human subjects. What we're seeing now is a restaging of just such a research experiment, one among many thousands which have been carried out to determine how wool actually behaves in use. In this experiment, we take two girls with similar physiological responses. We dress one entirely in wool, the other in a synthetic polyamide fibre. We make sure that the garments are identical in structure, weave, air permeability and thickness. We put the girls in a climate chamber a room meticulously sealed against the outside atmosphere. We hold the humidity at 90%, raise the temperature over half an hour from 28 degrees centigrade to 40 degrees centigrade, and keep it there for 65 minutes. 
Then, when our subjects are nicely cooked, we measure various factors directly affected by the conditions and by their clothing. These are some of the findings. The heartbeat of both girls has speeded up, but the synthetic girls has speeded up more. Both girls need more oxygen to supply the energy to keep their bodies at an acceptable temperature. But subsequent analysis of the expired air shows that the wool girl needs only 50 cc more per minute. The synthetic girl, 63 cc. Both girls have sweated profusely. The synthetic girl a tenth as much again as the wool girl. And finally, the most important finding of all, the effective evaporative cooling through the wool catsuit is half as much again as that of the synthetic one. So the wool girl has stayed cooler and more comfortable in these very unpleasant conditions than her fellow victim in the synthetic suit. As we've said, this is just one experiment. Different subjects would give different results. But the general principles it establishes have been widely tested. The results of experiments such as these have to be proved in the field. In this case, the ice field. Laboratory experiments suggested that if you wore wool socks in conditions like these, your blood flow would be two and a half times as great as if you wore a man-made fibre. And so the risk of frostbite would be that much less. They also suggested that wool underwear would retain body warmth almost half as well again as synthetic underwear. These scientific theories didn't trouble the huskies, but the human members of the world's first successful trans-Arctic expedition wore wool. Out of doors and in, and survived some of the worst conditions in the world. Another remarkable story of survival. When a trawler went down off Iceland, one man escaped to spend 10 hours in a lifeboat in icy seas and a night on shore in sub-zero temperatures. Doctors who examined him when he was brought back declared that he owed his survival to the fact that under his oilskins he was wearing wool from head to foot. Survival on the highest mountain in the world is one of the ultimate challenges to physical and mental endurance. And clothing can make a vital contribution to the conservation of a climber's energy. So the Japanese Everest expedition wore wool for protection in the extremes of climate and degrees of activity they encountered. Far greater extremes of climate were faced by the world's first space walker, Russian Colonel Leonov who reported on his return that wool, worn under his spacesuit, had kept him comfortable even at absolute zero, minus 273 degrees centigrade. Temperatures of 35 degrees centigrade above zero were the major problem for Australian long-distance runner Bill Emerton, as he tried to become the first man in the world to run the 125 miles of Death Valley, California. He too wore wool. And it wasn't until he took off his socks that he started to limp. Because wool's elasticity, which we've seen demonstrated in the laboratory, prevents the chafing of individual pressure points which develop into blisters. Blisters almost certainly didn't trouble the members of the Ford team for the London-Sydney rally. But 10,000 miles is still a long way if you're sitting down all the time. It may not seem quite so far if you're sitting on a sheepskin. In hospitals, sheepskins have been used instead of sheets for orthopedic and geriatric patients for quite a while. Now they're being used for car seats and for much the same reasons. They move easily with the body and spread its weight. They don't wrinkle. They absorb moisture and allow ventilation. This use of sheepskins is new, but it's growing. Car seats today may be aeroplane seats tomorrow. In anything from small executive jets to Concorde and other supersonic airliners of the future to lessen the risk of the pilot's perhaps aptly named occupational disease, Parkinson's. Passengers as well as pilots can benefit from wool. 
from its resilience and its capacity to absorb moisture and reduce noise. For the passenger cabins of the giant new jumbo jets, five major American airlines have specified that the carpets and upholstery should be wool. Clothing, whatever the circumstances in which it's to be worn, can be judged by two principal criteria from the point of view of the wearer's health. That it should help, not hinder, the natural temperature control system of the body. And that it should retain its physical properties unaffected by climatic or biological influences. The ideal clothing material would, in fact, both provide comfort and promote health. And of all fabrics, natural or man-made, wool comes closest to this ideal. Thank <laughs> you.